Balance your trading strategy by adding futures. CME Group helps you manage risk and capture opportunities in all market environments. Capitalize on around-the-clock access to highly liquid global futures and options market across all major asset classes. Just visit your online broker and get started. Plug into valuable educational materials and trading tools and see what adding futures can do for you at cmegroup.com slash on the tape. iConnections is the world's largest capital introduction platform in the alternative investment industry. They bring the asset management community together through a membership platform that lets allocators and managers meet and connect both physically and virtually. Over 3,000 allocators and 600 managers are part of the iConnections community, overseeing nearly $48 trillion and $16 trillion in assets, respectively. iConnections first came to our attention in 2020 during the first wave of the pandemic. That's when their first event, Funds for Food, became the largest virtual cap intro event in history. To date, they've donated nearly $2.5 million to charities. They are also the people behind the alternative investment industry's largest and most exciting in-person events. To find out more about iConnections events and members-only platform, visit iConnections.io. You're listening to a bonus episode of On the Tape. I'm Guy Adami. I'm always joined by Dan Nathan and our good friend Peter Bookvar of Bleakley Advisors and The Book Report. We're going to give you a preview of what's to come in the markets this week. And later, check out a great conversation with Peter and Connor Flynn, CEO of Kimco Realty. Peter, how are you, my man? Hey, Guy. Hi, Dan. Thanks for having me on. It's always great to have you back. Last week, interesting week in the market. Lots taking place. Obviously, for me, the biggest news was an anticipated 75 basis point hike by the ECB. But as anticipated as that was, that's the largest hike in the history of the ECB. And it comes at a time when Europe is an absolute mess. So through my lens, I say, Wow, think about the decisions they had to make. As bad as things are in terms of the economy, they still think inflation is such a huge problem that despite the economy, they had to make that raise. That speaks volumes as to what's going on in the world. And that's the case with all these central banks. The ECB, they have inflation north of 9%. In the UK, it potentially can reach 20% with the reset of the energy caps. They put themselves in a very awkward position of waiting as long as they did, and now they're trying to play catch up, and there are consequences to that. On the flip side with Europe, uh, negative rates essentially killed off the profitability of their banking system. So this may be at least as a lifeline to the European banking sector, which you can't have a healthy economy unless you have banks that are profitable and willing to lend. So that can be a potential positive within this, but there's no doubt Europe's in a recession. That recession will deepen because of the spike in energy prices as we get through the winter. And just because we get through the winter, it doesn't mean 2023 is going to be a bright spot. A lot of that, of course, will depend on how Putin manages the situation from here. It's amazing. We had this, what, nearly 10% decline in the S&P 500 from those mid-August highs. We bounced a little bit over the last few trading days here. I think part of the narrative is possibly that the Fed, after they go 75 basis points at their meeting the week after next, that maybe they take a bit of a back seat and let some of the other central banks around the world play a little catch up, but also at a time where we've seen crude oil roll over. We've seen the Baltic dry freight index roll over. We've seen lumber roll over. We've seen a lot of these inflationary inputs cool out a little bit. We're going to get CPI this week. If that is a softer reading, maybe the Fed has done the job in the near term and then they can take their kind of foot off the pedal and then we see, as it relates to markets, possibly there's some room to run, as we saw over the course of the summer, when, again, the narrative was that the Fed is going to need to pivot. Now, just one quick point. You just spoke about a recession in Europe. I think Guy is in the same camp as me. I just don't know how we could have a deep, prolonged recession in Europe and not have it affect the U.S. right now. I agree. So I'll take that in a few different parts. The positive yes is inflation is definitely moderating. And if you look at even the tips market, one year break evens are down to 1.7%. So sort of that has been tackled in a way that inflation I still believe is gonna be sticky, persistent, and well above that one to 2%. But those very elevated levels, we're sort of working our way through that. But a lot of that is because of the slow economy and the recession that we're either in or we're headed to. And when you talk about the markets, that is sort of the next hurdle that we now need to clear 
is the earnings come down. So in the beginning of the year, S&P earnings were about 220, and I'm relying on my Bloomberg terminal for these stats. Uh, going into uh, the reports of the second quarter, so right at the end of June, that was up to about 230, and now we're down to about 226. So you have what I believe will be the trajectory be lower on that, and still the big question of what's the right multiple to pay on this market? Like to me, still the frothiness in the market, and you guys have talked about it on, on your podcasts, and I completely agree. It's the high multiples and the money that's still being parked in these high beta, big cap tech companies and Apple and Microsoft that are still trading at a high 20s multiple for what is now more modest growth. I mean, Microsoft, and I have no position in it, but Dell and HP are big customers of theirs. And they're telling you things are slowing down in PC and even enterprise. And we know Apple's being challenged by, yes, they have the upgrade, but a quarter of Apple's business is in Europe. If you're wondering how you're going to pay your heating bill, you're not necessarily upgrading to the Apple 14. So I think we need the next stage is the earnings come down and evaluation reset more notably in those bigger cap names because other swaths of the market have already re-rated dramatically. There are plenty of cheap stocks out there that maybe will be more immune to a further decline in the markets relative to those big cap names. Last Thursday, Scott Minard was on the overtime with Scott Wapner. I think it was on with Scott. I apologize if it was somebody else. But, you know, he basically said stocks could go down anywhere between 20 and 30 percent this fall from the levels that we're at now, which obviously is pretty dramatic. I juxtapose that with there's still some people out there, Tom Lee specifically, who I admire a great deal, still thinks 5,100 is sort of in the cards at some point. I find it fascinating, Peter, that There's such a divergent range of thoughts in terms of this market. And quite frankly, they both could wind up being right in this really weird dystopian world that we find ourselves in where, you know, if stocks go down quickly enough and precipitously enough, it might force the Fed's hand a little bit that might get us the 5,100 by sometime early next year. Thoughts on that? So there's this belief that when the Fed stops hiking, everything will be fine. And... I wish it was going to be that easy because we're still going to have to deal with this economic slowdown and what I believe will be a more notable earnings decline. The Fed stopped hiking in early 2000. They started cutting in early 2001. Well, that wasn't really a big help to stocks. The Fed stopped cutting in the summer of 06. And yeah, we had further to run, but we know what we were driving ourselves into. And keep in mind that just because they stopped cutting, QT is still going to be going on. And the Fed has made it clear they're not going from ending the hikes to then going to cutting because inflation is still going to remain relatively sticky. And that's something that we're used to. The Fed hikes us into recession and then they start cutting. That's going to be somewhat different this time is they're going to stop hiking, but that doesn't mean we're going to immediately get to a pivot of cutting. So I still think that there's a multiple re-rate and the market's still trading in 18 times earnings for the S&P. Obviously, there are other parts of the market that are much cheaper. I mean, the Russell 2000 value stocks index is trading at 10 or 11 times earnings. So S&P is not going to bottom at 18 times earnings. I just don't see that. It's interesting. We were just talking about these mid-20s multiples for these mega cap tech names. And so the point is, is that we haven't seen a revision downward in expectations for earnings yet in the Apple and the Microsoft. And we'll kind of throw Google in there. Throw Tesla in there. You could throw Tesla in there, but that one is going to be a bit of an outlier. We've said that a lot. I mean, this market really can't bottom until there's an absolute bloodletting in a name like that. But when you think about an Apple and Microsoft, you think of the monopolies they have, the moats that they have, the cash that they have. And so even with the re-rating that we've seen across tech in 2022, I mean, again, Apple is expected to have high single digits earnings growth here, which might prove to be high and it's trading about 25 times or so. And I guess you and I have kind of gone back and forth on this topic. You were on Fast Money a few weeks ago and you were talking about value and there's plenty of opportunities to kind of put money in places. I kind of still think that those names are going to attract a lot of capital for all the reasons I mentioned before, which might keep their valuations well into the 20s in PE terms, which might actually, to your point, that the S&P you just said won't bottom out in 18 times. Well, it actually 
might bottom out at a much higher PE multiple than prior cycles because we've never had the sort of concentration in S&P earnings. Is that fair to say and in market cap terms? I certainly don't want to discount that possibility for sure. Let's just take Apple and Microsoft again. Can you go from a high 20s multiple to even 20 with no change in the fundamentals of that business because of rates staying higher than longer and inflation being higher than what we're used to? Will they get to a valuation reset for those, even if their businesses don't change? I mean, you look at Microsoft, you want to talk about moats. In 2000, they probably had 85% of the PC software business. There was no bigger moat than Microsoft at that time, but it went through 13 years of multiple digestion, you can say, because earnings and profits grew every single year all throughout the 2000s. But I think you bring up the right point is where is that right multiple? And none of us know really the answer to it right now. I just think that when all said and done, that multiple is going to end up lower because we are just in a higher interest rate environment and a higher interest rate environment for longer is going to change the multiple in everything. I was at Kara Switcher's Code Conference last week, Peter. In in about 48 hours, you had Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Alphabet. You had Andy Jazzy, the CEO of Amazon. Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, all speak. And it was interesting just kind of reading the body language of all of them. The cross currents, the headwinds to growth, all these sorts of things. The strong dollar, disrupted supply chains, deglobalization, shooting war in Europe, the potential for further disruption to supply chains in Asia if there's some dust up between China and Taiwan. All of that, I guess, the longer we go into this year, as we get towards the end of next year, then we start just not thinking a whole heck of a lot about 2022 and really start factoring in how long of a slowdown we have and when we come out. And again, we know this as strategists, as investors, as traders, but the body language I got from those three CEOs, which have a combined market cap of $6 trillion, over $1.2 trillion in combined sales, wasn't exactly that negative, to be honest with you. They didn't seem like a bunch of CEOs, and I'm sure there's plenty of things that keep them up at night, but it just didn't seem that they're about to go into a protracted recession and as far as they care about the stuff, a bear market relative to their stock prices. I think what makes a company great is those that look out multiple years. And particularly the code conference, I mean, you tell me since you were there, people want to hear what their big picture vision is. And not necessarily, well, how's the current quarter going? And are you going to have to clip earnings estimates like Microsoft did because of FX? So maybe that is one of the reasons. Also, there's still a month left in the quarter. And none of these companies are immune to an economic slowdown. You take Amazon's AWS business compared to Microsoft's cloud business. Microsoft's cloud business is predominantly enterprise. So they're gonna have better visibility and not be as susceptible to a broader economic slowdown than Amazon's AWS business, which has a lot of small companies. If you open up a 20 person business, you're probably using AWS. And if you're having a very difficult time here, in the economy, if you have to shut down, well, you're gonna shut down your AWS subscription. So I think that there's economic sensitivity that all these companies are experiencing, but I think a conference like this is, their job is to go there and tell people what the next five to 10 years are gonna look like, rather than what the short term is going to be. And you know, getting back to the multiple conversation is, we've seen this, we've all been doing this for a long time. What turns a growth company into a value stock is just a slowdown in that growth rate. And it's a slowdown in that growth rate that makes people rethink that multiple. Like Apple for years to come will be this dominant company, but their growth rate's naturally going to slow. And I know you guys have talked about it. Their revenue growth in the prior quarter was 2%. So do you pay 27 times earnings for a company that's growing mid single digits? Maybe you do. I mean, you're paying a high multiple for Coke and Procter and Gamble, and maybe Apple will settle into that consumer product type multiple, but you could get into a market cycle where 20 times instead of 28 times. Well, if that's the case, the stock's down 25, 30% in just a multiple re-rate. And then getting to my point earlier, it's still a consumer products company that they need to sell. It's high price products and your European customer is crimped. And it'll be interesting to see how the Chinese consumer responds in this quarter and what Apple has to say about that business as well. Peter, what's the scenario where the market gets through this period of time relatively unscathed? And quite frankly, where we are right now is relatively unscathed in terms of the broader markets. 
I think it's two things, a continuation of this downward trend in inflation and the ability of the U.S. economy to be able to grow through a higher rate environment. And when I say higher, I meant higher rate, not high. We obviously are still very low interest rates, but a higher rate environment than we've seen for the last couple of, well, I don't want to say decades, but at least the last decade where we lived on zero rates and the housing market lived on a two and a half, three percent mortgage rate. And now we're in this new rate world. And what is the potential growth rate for the next five years in this higher rate environment? If we can continue to power through and absorb this rate shock and companies can get a still a good return on their investor capital at our higher borrowing rate, and then maybe we can get through this okay. And I think that's going to be a test. The U.S. economy is about to be tested with this rate shock. Putting aside inflation, what the Fed's going to do, we've had a rate shock. And if you're a company that's barred floating rate and you just saw a 300 basis point rise in your interest expense and your cash flows are now slowing, are you going to be able to manage through that? And we're going to about to see that test over the coming quarters. When we come back, Peter's conversation with Connor Flynn, CEO of Kimco Realty. With CME Group Micro Futures and Options, you can get the same access and capital efficiencies of the standard contracts with less upfront financial commitment. Diversify your portfolio and add flexibility by trading CME Group Micro Contracts in crypto, precious metals, FX, energy, and equity indices. Learn more about what adding futures can do for you at cmegroup.com slash micros. iConnections is the world's largest capital introduction platform in the alternative investment industry. They bring the asset management community together through a membership platform that lets allocators and managers meet and connect both physically and virtually. Over 3,000 allocators and 600 managers are part of the iConnections community, overseeing nearly $48 trillion and $16 trillion in assets, respectively. iConnections first came to our attention in 2020 during the first wave of the pandemic. That's when their first event, Funds for Food, became the largest virtual cap intro event in history. To date, they've donated nearly $2.5 million to charities. They are also the people behind the alternative investment industry's largest and most exciting in-person events. To find out more about iConnections events and members-only platform, visit iConnections.io. I'm Peter Bookfar. This is another episode of the Book Report CEO Podcast. Today, we're going to go off the tape with Connor Flynn. He's the chief executive officer with Kimco Realty, which is the largest publicly traded owner of open air shopping centers. Connor, thanks for uh, joining me today. Peter, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. So before we get into details about your business, we just want to hear first of how you got to this position. I know you, after school, did you go right into real estate? Was there something first? And was there always a passion for real estate? It's a good question, Peter. I, I always had, I guess, the real estate in my bones growing up. My parents are both born and raised in Ireland immigrated over to the United States. And I think as part of that culture, uh, real estate or property, as it's known in the European side, is part of, I think, the DNA. And so I did have a fleeting interest in investment banking. So I did an investment banking internship when I was in college and then quickly realized that my passion really was focused on the property side of it, looking at looking at assets and seeing all the hard work from a before and after transformation take place. And that's where I sort of threw myself. So Right out of school, I was lucky enough to work for Kimco. At that time, I was just sort of rotating between different groups. I started in the acquisitions group, then moved into leasing, and was fortunate enough to have a lot of great mentors along the way that shepherded me in the right direction. I think everybody that reaches a certain part of their career has a lot of people to thank. It starts with my parents, and then it goes from there. But fortunately, Kimco has continued to give me a tremendous amount of opportunity, room for growth, and I've been on... The West Coast, living in California, that's where I really sort of earned my chops, redeveloping assets in the Bay Area, moved back to New York City to do grad school while working. In New York City, I went to Columbia and did my master's in real estate development. And then when I finished that program, an opportunity to run the West Coast popped up at Kimco, so they moved me back to the West Coast. And then after that, an opportunity to become COO of the company popped up, and so they moved me back to New York. And since then, the previous CEO retired and I stepped up into the CEO role. So a nice way for me to sort of learn the business from the ground up through all different iterations and parts of the organization in the regional structure and then move back to corporate. And that's where I am today. 
and much easier to just work for one company and climb that ladder, which you certainly did. The old school company man, I guess. There's not many left. I think most people these days think two years is a long tenure. I've been very lucky. Worked for some incredible people and surround myself with incredible people. And that's really helped me. And Kimco has a long history. From what I read, this goes back 60 years, the beginning of it. That's right. Yeah, we're very proud of our history, actually. The founder and chairman, Milton Cooper, is sort of renowned as the founder of the modern REIT era, which is now over a trillion dollars business. We were the first ever REIT to go public in 91 and sort of set the stage for a slew of many, many REITs in many different categories now that are public and widely accepted. And now you guys have over 530 shopping centers around the country in almost 30 states. And I know you have interests in about 27 more. Now, you had made an acquisition last year, Weingarten, that added about 150 shopping centers. What was attractive about Weingarten that you did the deal? And was it a geographical decision that got you into certain markets that you were not in beforehand? Or is it sort of fill-ins to existing markets that you had? Yeah. So when I became CEO, we did a pretty significant strategic shift and moved our portfolio to be focused on first ring suburbs in the major metro markets. So concentrating in where we thought supply and demand was in balance or in the landlord's favor. And we also shifted the portfolio away from commodity power centers is what we call them. Power centers is typically your category killer lineup. So think big box after big box after big box of your who's who of who dominates categories. And we shifted away from the power center to more the grocery anchor shopping center as we felt like that was more resilient and felt like that was really the growth vehicle for the organization going forward. We're 80% grocery anchored today. The other 20% is a mix of power centers that are in different phases of redevelopment. The nice part about power centers is there's more acreage, there's more land to work with. So your highest and best use there might be something else other than retail. And that's where we've been focusing on entitling the highest and best use. So for us, it's really focused on apartments and we've entitled over 5,000 apartment units activated over 2,000. And our goal for over the next three years is to get to 15,000. So we're well on our way of achieving those goals. And the portfolio transformation has really helped Kimco outperform the peer group over the last three and five years. And so the, when the Weingarten opportunity presented itself, it was very fortunate the timing was almost ideal because we saw the recovery in our own shopping centers, predominantly in the Sun Belt, where Weingarten was based, really starting to accelerate and it was in the midst of the pandemic when everybody was hands up, sort of worrying about the sky is falling. And we saw the fundamentals really coming back strong for grocery anchored shopping centers. And that's exactly what Weingarten owned in the best markets in the Sun Belt. We saw the Sun Belt really accelerating at that time and thought that that would be a unique opportunity to combine the organizations and give us really strategic advantage in some of the fastest growing markets across the country. And so the, the combination came together quickly. The timing was great. It was one of those rare deals where both companies traded up on the day that we announced. It was a unique situation where I think we delevered the balance sheet with the uh, integration as well. So it was a fortunate combination that allowed us to enhance our growth profile and delever at the same time in, some, in the markets we've been really looking to enhance the, the portfolio. So it's one of those rare situations where I think everything lined up for us. And that grocery anchor, it's like when back in the day with the enclosed mall, where the department stores were the anchor. It was the reason why people made a trip to the mall, the enclosed mall, and now with the open air shopping center, it's that supermarket that is the draw that people have to go to unless they get obviously at home delivery, but it becomes a destination trip for them. And then you can also fill in, because I know some of your other big tenants are like TJ Maxx and Home Depot and Ross Stores and PetSmart. So you can sort of also fill in that it's a must drive to your shopping center as opposed to, do I want to go to the mall, the enclosed mall or not? Do I want to browse or not? You're creating sort of a captive audience, it seems, for the markets that you're in. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think when you look at a merchandising mix, you want to try and drive traffic at all points during the day. And the grocery anchor is the most consistent traffic driver. So when you look at like a TJ Maxx and they're a phenomenal operator, they really don't drive the same amount of traffic traffic on a weekly basis as a grocery store does. So your typical grocer sometimes drives two to three trips per week. And that's really exciting because then you get the halo effect of those cross trapping trips. And so the grocery anchor continues to be where we want to put our focus. And we think there's a number of reasons why it's got a wider moat than other retail uses. A lot of commodity type retailers 
there's a lot of debate on, is it going all online? Is it going somewhat to online or is there a omni-channel approach? And so what we've seen is the grocery anchor continues to be the hub of where people want to shop. And then there is these ancillary items that people also want to shop the most convenient way possible. And so whether you want it delivered to your home, people do that. They go online, they shop, and they have it delivered to their home all the time. That last mile grocery store, the last mile meaning the closest to where people live, is what's servicing that online order. And so the big takeaway from the pandemic was it crystallizes the value of the store for the retail chain, because not only is it encouraging people to come in the store where the margins are the highest, but that store can be utilized as a distribution and fulfillment point, whether it's buy online, pick up in store, whether it's curbside pickup, whether it's delivery to the home, that's really where it's now being focused because you don't have to pay for the shipping. You don't have to pay for the person driving the car, the gas mileage, all those things add up to, if you can service the consumer from that closest point, your margin gets enhanced. And so that's why I think when we looked at our portfolio, we've really continued to lean into that grocery anchored property where it's going to be servicing the customer in a variety of ways. And I know through this, you've sort of created a new acronym, as, as you say, the BOPIS. So when people go, there are dedicated parking spots, right, for pickup. So you're not just making it easier for the store in terms of them creating their own distribution facility within the store, but you are sort of advertising to the customer that we will provide an easy in and out for you to pick up what you just bought online. That's exactly right. I mean, I think when you boil it down, you have to ask yourself, what do consumers really want today? And I think the majority are still very focused on convenience and value. And if we can solve for both of those major themes, then I think we have the ability to enhance our cash flow growth, have pricing power. And if we can make the store more valuable, that usually lends itself to the landlord having pricing power and the ability to push rents and grow cash flow. And so what we thought was, why not activate the parking lot for curbside pickup, which a lot of people use during the pandemic because they didn't want to go in the store. Maybe they were risk averse. Maybe they felt more comfortable. Whatever the reason was, it just continues to this day where people like the convenience factor of driving in. In essence, it's like a drive through You drive in, there's these stalls that are labeled curbside pickup, and then you can call whatever store you're shopping at, and they know where you are because we use a very simple, almost if you've been to a sports game, you park in lot A1. That's the same thing we use. We use A123, and you just tell them which spot you're in, and then they fill up the back of your car with your goods. That continues to be, I think, a nice bonus as customers are gravitating towards it. They like the convenience factor. I have young kids. If I have three kids in a car and I'm going to get something, the thought of getting them out and in the car alone is a hurdle that's pretty high. And if you don't have to clear that hurdle, that's a nice thing to be able to do. Yeah, without question. So that supermarket creates definitely a sticky customer. Now in that shopping center, you have the supermarket, you'll have PetSmart, you'll also have like the local dry cleaner and the local pizza shop as well. That's right. We think merchandising mix is really important because it has to not only service the customer and the demographic that you're providing for, but it also connects to the community. And the key is, is the community aspect is one where if there's a local shop that's renowned in the community, you're more than likely going to support that local shop because it's part of the fabric of the community. And so what we try and do is we find those unique operators that are really great at whatever it is they do. It could be waffles in the morning. It could be bagels. It could be, you name it. And so the nice part about having the anchor tenant, like the grocery store, is you have that daily traffic driver, but then you try and enhance the surroundings with the offerings and the merchandising mix that drives people to the shopping center at all points during the day. So you have your awesome coffee bagel shop in the morning. You have your great salad or chicken quick service restaurant in the middle of the day. And then in the afternoon, we like to have those treasure hunters, Ross or TJ Maxx or Home Goods or Burlington, where people shop not knowing what they're gonna buy, but they still see that and say, oh, there's an opportunity to find a deal. And so that's the ideal merchandising mix that you try and create is find a unique offering that's going to drive traffic all during the day and have those dominant anchors that help the credit profile of the shopping center. And the mixed use that you said over the next couple of years will be about 15% of your total portfolio. I mean, that tries to create a sticky environment as well. It's like you're sort of creating your own community where you can live, you can work, you can shop all within walking distance. Now, is that being done redeveloping older shopping centers or are you guys trying to find raw land and building it literally from scratch? 
for us, it's focused on redeveloping existing shopping centers into those mixed use communities. And what we've been able to do is we feel like there's a better risk adjusted return doing that because you've already got the built in place that people are used to coming and visiting and shopping. And so whenever you take down raw land, you have to take a very large and long process of trying to create the place. And that can be very rewarding, but can also be very unrewarding if it doesn't go well. And so we found with the tremendous portfolio that we have, and again, we're focused on that first ring suburb in the top 20 major metro markets, where we always thought, and our thesis was, is that the big CBDs are going to push out. There's going to be sort of this sprawl where all of a sudden our shopping center is going to be surrounded by density. And if you think about the most underutilized form of commercial real estate, you would typically think about shopping centers because 80% of the land is dedicated to parking lot. It's not generating any revenue. 20% is single story buildings. And so if you're surrounded by these towers of apartments, office, hotels, whatever it is, you're typically sitting on at the base of it, raw land that is totally underutilized. And so that's where we've focused our efforts on putting together a team that is laser focused on unlocking entitlements across the portfolio for the highest and best use of the real estate. And so typically it is activating parts of the parking lot for apartment towers that we can add to the shopping center. Now with the multifamily, are you operating them in house? Like you created a separate division for that since, I mean, it's a similar skill set, but you're talking about usually one to two year leases, more of a fickle tenant relative to a supermarket where are you guys outsourcing that management? Yeah, so we definitely want to walk before we run, and we're not egocentric at Kimco. So we try and make sure that we recognize that it's not our expertise, right? You sort of focus on what you do best and make sure you have the core competency. So to date, what we've done is we've taken a little bit of a differentiated approach than others, and we've ground leased certain portions of the portfolio to apartment developers. Now, ground lease, in essence, if you're not familiar with that term, it's very simple. It's exactly that. You lease the ground to a developer, and they come in, and they develop the apartments, and they just pay you a lease on the ground. So they take on the management, they take on the rollover, they take on the apartment expertise. We still own the land, but they just pay us a rental fee on the land. That is sort of the most risk averse way to do it. And then we've also entered into joint ventures where we contribute the land at a marked up basis, in essence, getting paid for our entitlement work. And we contribute it into a new joint venture with a best in class apartment developer operator where we know we've aligned ourselves with the dominant player in that trade area so that we feel very comfortable riding side saddle, watching them, learning from them as we go forward. So those are the two approaches that we've seen that have been working for us. We continue to evolve and we're continuing to learn every day. But to date, that's what we've done. And we feel very fortunate that we've got wonderful partners and activating wonderful projects. So let them deal with the 2 a.m., oh, my toilet's not working and come fix it now. We've got plenty of those in our own portfolio, a roof leak or an irrigation issue or the sprinkler head that's off or somebody ran it over. So no, we've aligned ourselves with the best in class and try and make sure that we're learning and watching and trying to figure it out. And we like the business. That's the best part of it. The thesis was it's actually going to enhance our growth because if you bring in the apartments, you have built in a shopper base. And then typically that allows you to charge more rent for your retail. And what we found is that it actually allows you to charge more rent for the apartments as well. Because if you think about take New York City, for example, and we don't own anything in New York City, but just for an apartment pricing exercise. If you were to lease an apartment, the amenity package would probably determine how much you could lease that apartment for. If you had a pool, if you had a gym, if you had a grocery store, if you had a coffee shop, if you had a dry cleaner, that's exactly what we already have. We've already built in the amenity base into the apartment complex. So in essence, they're able to charge a significant premium to their apartments because of the amenity base that we've built. And so we are understanding that that's a real differentiator that allows you to price above market rents that we can actually activate. And so that's why we sort of shifted more towards the joint venture model. And I'm sure over the last couple of years with the sharp rise in construction costs, your partners are probably grateful that they have that pricing power in terms of the rents they can charge to absorb what they probably weren't necessarily budgeting pre-COVID and going through COVID with whether it's lumber or whatever, steel prices and so on. You're exactly right. I mean, the ability to push the costs onto the consumer. I'm sure you've been following the apartment rents and and where they're headed and all the results and the same site NOI growth of the apartments that we have has been phenomenal. You have the ability to reprice those every year typically. And so who knows how long the consumer can handle it, but 
to date, you've seen upwards of 15 to sometimes 20% increases. I make sure to read the apartmentlist.com's monthly national report as a good guide for that. Now, in terms of markets, I know you guys are on the West Coast, the East Coast, presence in Florida and Texas, one in Denver. Are there markets that you're not currently in that you want to be in? And if the case, do you try to buy your way in or you try to develop your way into those newer markets? Yeah, it's a really good question because it's pretty strategic on how you want to operate your business and what's the highest return on your time. So I'm a big believer coming from the operations side. We needed to get economies of scale. And in order to do that, we had to really concentrate the portfolio so that we could, in essence, operate at a higher level rather than operate at a number of different assets in a number of different markets and not be really local experts. And real estate, especially retail, is very localized. And so what we've done is we've created these pockets, these clusters of assets surrounding the top 20 major metro markets. And so we look for new markets all the time. Actually, through One Garden, we picked up San Antonio as a new market, which is a really fast growing market that we've always liked and always wanted to be in, but didn't have a presence there. Now we really have a foothold there and we're going to look to grow that. The same goes for other markets that we're watching closely. Some we missed. I mean, we're not perfect. We missed Nashville. We don't have a presence in Nashville. And that's a wonderful market that's really just exploded. The issue, though, is you can't really go in one shop with one shopping center. In order to really have scale, you need to go in with, in our opinion, you need to go in with a sizable portfolio in order to have it make it worth. We're big believers. You got to live and breathe your assets. And we got to have boots on the ground on these assets that are walking on every day. So let's just say you got that cluster. Yeah. How many miles away would the centers be in order to not be too close, but enough for you to have a good market share? They can be right across the street from each other. You really control the retail node that way. So typically it's a one day drive. We wanna try and make sure we have everybody, if they're managing a portfolio, they can get to every asset in one day. That's sort of the way that we think about it is you have a concentration of assets that allows you to be optimizing your time, right? It's all about time and your return on time. And we found that when you're dispersed, a lot of your travel time is just not productive as it could be. So that's the way we've done it. But there's loads of markets out there that we love to have a bigger concentration in or ones that we don't necessarily have a presence in. But for us, anyways, the incremental costs of adding a shopping center in one of our existing clusters where we don't have to add any GNA versus starting a fresh market, that's what we look at. And again, the allocation of capital there, it's pretty clear to us that we should just incrementally increase our cluster strategy unless a unique opportunity like a San Antonio presents itself. You focus on the markets where there's population growth, there's job growth and so on. We know a lot of that has been taking place in the Sun Belt. Are there any markets that you're in that is not living up to your expectations? And you say, you know what, maybe we should better allocate these resources somewhere else. Or you're happy with the markets that you're in? So I will tell you that my previous experiences have probably shaped my thoughts on certain markets that are not necessarily true today. So one of the markets we picked up in the wine garden transaction is Las Vegas. And Las Vegas was one that I managed through the great financial crisis. I was out West. There was a lack of diversity of economic growth there. And so when the gaming market dried up there, it was not a pretty place to be from a retail perspective. Demographics shift rapidly there because there's really sort of a sprawl in Vegas. There's not really barriers to entry there. They sort of build the next new shiny thing, another ring out, and that's where the wealth goes. And so what once was the dominant corridor can change really rapidly. Now, since then, Vegas has diversified quite a bit. Since I was there anyways, and I'm dating myself, they have a number of new sports teams, NFL, NHL. They've got a diversity of economic growth drivers. So that's one we're continuing to do a lot of research on. I don't want to necessarily jump to conclusions on it because when I was there, it was a little different. But people love Las Vegas, and there's a lot of economic growth drivers there. But when there's a lack of economic diversity in a market, that's what makes me nervous because it's not as buoyant to go through the waves we've seen before. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And speaking of which, during COVID, one of the challenges that well, business obviously had and you as a landlord is some stores just couldn't open. If there was face-to-face -face needs in a particular store, that business couldn't be open. How did you manage helping the tenant, but at the same time knowing that you have to pay your bills as well? How did you manage that tenant landlord situation when so many stores were closed for a period of time? The non-essential stores that had no choice but to close, but wanted to stay in business when we got through COVID. 
nobody was prepared for that, right? Nobody had a pandemic playbook. And for us, we were fortunate where the lion's share of our retailers were deemed essential, like the grocery stores that were able to operate through it. Where it became very tricky was when you were deemed non-essential and you were forced to close. So what we tried to do was focus on the tenants that needed the help the most, which was typically the small shops, the ones that didn't have rainy day funds, big balance sheets, the ones that were operating sort of on a day-by-day, week-by-week basis. The PPP program that the government launched, we felt was a great opportunity to help our tenants get access to that capital to help them weather the storm. And so what we did was we developed a full service operation dedicated to our small shop tenants to go through the PPP program to help them fill out all the paperwork. We even paid for their attorneys to go through the PPP program, which was not as simple as it probably was designed to be but it really helped a lot of those small mom and pop retailers get the rainy day funds they needed to weather the storm. And we told our bigger retailers that had balance sheets, we told them it was tough, but we had to be very tough because in those days, the people with the big balance sheets needed to flex their balance sheets. They should be paying us the rent because in essence, that allows us to go and help the small businesses. And the U.S. is still, in my opinion, based on small business engine growth. And so that was our strategy. It seemed to work. We did give deferrals for a lot of these tenants that were deemed non-essential. So in essence, don't pay us for two, three months, but those three months of rent are due. They're just due on the back of your lease term. And so that's what we've been doing. And we've been collecting on that and it's been doing very well. Right. So to buy these businesses time to get them to the eventual reopening that we're obviously in the midst of. I know through that good relationship that you have with your tenants, you've been able to get through with a very high occupancy. Just want to talk quickly about the hidden asset you have in the holdings of Albertsons, and then just talk macro-wise on what you're seeing with the consumer. Now, Albertsons is an interesting holding of yours because not only is it a tenant, but it's been a very successful investment. And I believe the lockup period is this month. What's your strategy? You don't have to go into full detail, but is it a long-term relationship from a tenant-landlord's perspective, or it will maintain that as a shareholder as well? We're very fortunate where we've been able to make a lot of value through focusing on unlocking the real estate value that is owned by our retailers. Now you're seeing a lot of funds and do it now, but we did this for decades where we focused on retailers that are real estate rich, that are not getting credit for their own real estate. That's what sort of was the thesis behind getting involved in Albertson. It's a long story, but in essence, we bought defunct grocery banners from Super Value. We rolled it up under Albertsons. We took Safeway Private, which was a public company on the West Coast. We combined that with Albertsons, brought in some great management, took it public. And now we're sitting with billion three, a billion four of marketable securities in Albertsons, where our tax basis is $100 million. So we've had a wonderful, wonderful investment there. We are one of the largest landlords for Albertsons as well. So it is a bit interesting to have a foot in in a number of different ways. Our strategy is the lockup expires this month. We've been very focused on this where we are going to monetize around three to $350 million a year so that we can reinvest those proceeds back in our business. And we've been able to communicate that to the street and have them understand that there's REIT rules where this is a pretty unique situation for a REIT to be in where you have this big of a taxable gain because the REIT rules were set up where You're not really supposed to have a billion plus dollars of taxable gain coming from non-real estate as a REIT. So we want to maintain our REIT status. That's priority number one. And so in order to do that, we can only really have three to 400 million of taxable gains per year. And so for us to do that, we have to have sort of a methodical approach of selling the shares three to 400 a year until we monetize the investment, redeploy those as best we can into our business, whether it's We've got a suite of opportunities and investments. We're really excited to finally monetize and redeploy that. And we feel like there's going to be some incredible opportunities for growth for Kimco going forward. And with the higher cost of capital, that certainly is a nice source of financing. No question. One thing that I know you guys have done very well is manage your balance sheet, where most of your debt, almost all of it is fixed. And this rise in short-term interest rates impacting floating rate debt hasn't really mattered to you guys. Yeah, we're big believers since we have long-term assets is to have long-term debt and have it be fixed. 99% of our debt is fixed. And we just did a recent 10-year bond, reopened the market 
at the time that we thought it was a high coupon, but it's already much higher today than it was back two, three months ago. And we were able to access the 30 year bond market. We have the longest debt maturity profile in the peer group at over 10 years, no maturing debt really now for another two years. And so we bought ourselves, I think a nice runway to see what happens and have the highest cash position we've ever had the lowest debt we've ever had in the company's history and have the Albertsons monetization be some nice dry powder as well to put to work. So we've always been very focused on maintaining a very strong balance sheet. We're triple B plus BAA one. Our strategic goal is to get to A minus A3. The only thing with that goal is that we don't control that destiny. The rating agencies, I think, are still a bit nervous about any type of upgrades, especially in the changing environment that we're in. But we actually price as an A minus A3 already. If you look at our spreads versus the A minus A3 category, we're already right on top of them. So that I guess is the benefit we'll take, but we're in a very strong position there because typically when the tide goes out, the balance sheet becomes the number one important metric. And that A category is from what uh, triple E plus right now to help you one. I want to wrap this up by just giving some color on the macro. Obviously everyone's debating recession, no recession. The way I put it is more, it could be a recession for some, but not for others. Now, obviously you've structured your business to be a destination, a necessity destination, but you still see, I'm sure, changes in traffic trends or maybe not, or any consumer trends that you're seeing in this more fragile state that the U.S. economy is in. Yeah, it's a really tricky time. I mean, we watch traffic very closely. To date, our traffic is higher than last year. So that's one we're watching. We continue to see the shopper. And again, we offer everyday goods and services. So I think that's a pretty critical aspect of what we're offering. We don't see where the consumer wallet is necessarily shifting towards. So we don't have, I would say, the data that shows that they're buying chicken instead of steak. That continues to be something we're looking for through our earnings of our tenant base. But the traffic is still strong. The pricing of our assets is still very, very strong. We haven't seen any dislocation there yet. We're waiting because we think we could be opportunists there. But the private markets are very healthy for grocery and good shopping centers. The public peers are out still looking for acquisitions as well. The consumer is stretched, I would say, on the lower end. There's no question about it that they're facing the real impact of inflation, right? But the silver lining is gas prices have come down pretty significantly recently. So that, in essence, has become, I think, a relief valve. And the employment market is still strong. So I know everyone's trying to determine where we are and where we're headed, but it is very tricky as there's components of this economy that show that there's little to no recession going on while other parts of it are starting to shine bright lights on different cracks in the economy. Yeah, there's no question. I like to say that the U.S. economy is not this light switch that just goes on and off. Like there could be a dimmer. It can vacillate in different directions sort of in between. And as you said, the labor market is still pretty healthy. And the interesting thing is that how we would define a recession potentially can be an unemployment rate of four and a half percent instead of three and a half, where four and a half percent used to be historically very low. That used to be the bottom end of a rate that we would see in a recession. Now it could be the top end. It'd be interesting if that four and a half comes to a fruition from participation rate going up too. Like that's another piece of it, right? That could be really interesting to watch. That's exactly right. The August payroll number, we saw a rise in the unemployment rate from three and a half to three seven. And that's because you had a 700,000 plus rise in the size of the labor force on top of a rise in employment that was less than that. So it actually rose for good reason. It's interesting. Kimco, I think, is going to be one of those unique situations where there's going to be a lot of probably noise in the economy and things like that. But we're still in a reopening phase where we're seeing record demand for space literally no new supply, pricing power in the landlord favor, we're able to really push rents and really have good strong spreads where there could be a slight pullback. And I think where we're positioned, it may not impact the reopening dynamic that we're experiencing because it's so strong, but we'll, we'll have to see. And I think the last thing we learned is also that people still like to go out and shop. It's easy to say, oh, I'm just going to stay on my couch and click buttons and have it delivered. But people like to go out. They like to see things. They like to try things on. They want to be out there themselves. No question about it. And the value proposition of the last mile store, that is the biggest takeaway in my opinion of the pandemic. I think there was a lot of people debating the real value proposition of brick and mortar retail. And you can make a case for it was all heading online. If the government can shut down certain retailers and still they survive and think that the physical store is the highest margin, best way to invest going forward, that sort of, I think, puts a rest to that argument. I completely agree. And all we have to see is the online businesses that are now opening physical stores. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, we're back to the fundamentals, right? Of like where the cash flow growth is coming from, where the highest margins are, 
oh, it happens to be the store. Let's reinvest in store growth. Agreed. Well, Connor, I can't thank you enough. Your insights were great. I think that the listener got a deep dive on your business and I really appreciate having you on. Always nice to see you, Peter. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Nothing in this broadcast should be construed as investment advice, nor a recommendation to buy or sell securities. The discussion is for informational purposes only and past performance is not indicative of future results. The specific securities discussed may be held by Peter Bookvar personally and or purchased, sold, or recommended to Bleakly clients. Thanks once again to CME Group and iConnections for sponsoring this episode of On The Tape. If you like what you heard, make sure you hit follow and leave us a review. It helps people find our show and we love hearing from you. You can also email us at onthetape at riskreversal.com anytime. Follow and connect with us on Twitter at onthetapepod, and we'll see you next time. On the Tape is a Risk Reversal media production. This podcast is for informational purposes only. All opinions expressed by me, Dan Nathan, Guy Adami, Danny Moses, and any other participants are solely our opinions and should not be relied upon for specific investment decisions. (laughs) 